Two of the sweetest words in the hockey language are being said in Nashville this morning. Not yet. Your Locked On Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the Locked On Predators podcast, and thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are your free daily Nashville Predators podcast. We're a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. want to kick off this Wednesday episode with a special shout out to our Locked On Pred heads. Those are our everydayers who tune in to talk Nashville Predators hockey with us Monday through Friday. We thank you for your support, and we love that we get to spend just a little bit of your day with you. I'm Ann Kimmel. I am a writer at Penalty Box Radio. I'm usually joined by my partner in crime, Nick Morgan, but Nick can't be here this morning. If you headed to bed at a decent hour like a sane human being, or if you let Valley's 11 p.m. blackout be your sign that the Predator season was over, have I? A surprise for you. Nashville came back to win game five in the third period and earn a chance to play a game six at Bridgestone Arena on Friday night. We are going to talk about the game last night. We're going to talk about a couple of the highs and lows and a little bit of the ugly from the game. We're also going to talk about why this series against this particular Vancouver Canucks team may end up being one of the best things to happen to the Predators. We're going to do all of that in this episode, but before we dive into everything, do want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. The Nashville Predators headed to Vancouver in a must-win playoff game last night and are flying back to Nashville, preparing for a game six after getting a two to one victory. Of course, here at Locked On Predators, you know that we always kick off our game recaps, sharing one word to describe the game. I reached out on Twitter to get some one words from our listeners, and you all did not disappoint. This game gave us about as many options for one words as the disaster that game four was. So let's talk about some of your one words to describe this game five win in Vancouver. Izel, your one word is beautiful. Sheila Tope, one word is determined. Nate the Great, no quit. Typed it in all one words, capital N, capital Q. Way to make it fit in the rules, Nate, but we really don't play by any rules here. Several of you use the words gutsy and relentless. And, you know, as I was thinking about one word, gutsy was definitely one at the very top of my list as well. This was a game that the Predators really had to gut out to win. Who dat in Tennessee? Whew. Joseph Weil, well, forgive me if I say that wrong, Joseph, your one word was redemption. And man, did Nashville need some sort of a redemption performance in game five. Did you get very trotzed? Your one word is CPR. I like that. Uh, Seth Wright. Okay, you know we are here at Lockdown Preds for any sort of Ted Lasso uh, talk. Seth Wright's one word is hope. And as Ted Lasso knows, it's the hope that kills you. That may end up being true in game six or in game seven or in a second round series for Nashville Predators fans. But last night, Nashville came back from a 1-0 third period deficit to win this game 2-1. So what is my one word to describe this game? Well, this one word is very personal, but I'm going to share it with you all. My one word is, you called it right. That's a quote, word for word. That was a quote from my husband at 11.56 p.m. last night as the game ended. So, of course, I have to bring it here and say that my one word is my husband telling me you called it right. We had kind of a big debate going, especially after the way that the Predators lost game four. And my husband kind of felt like, look, Nashville is going to go in. They are not going to be able to bounce back from the way that game four loss went down. They're going to drop this game 5-1-6-1. It's going to be a big blowout and Vancouver is going to win the series. My prediction was that this was still going to be a really close game. And I even said the final score is going to be two to one. 
And I think Nashville could pull it out, but I also wouldn't be surprised if Vancouver did. But what I really believed was that there wasn't going to be a blowout in game five after how Nashville ended and lost game four. I also just don't see this series opening up. And that's something that I've said here before. I just don't see this series opening up that wide between these two teams. Look, Nashville has had to come back after some colossal losses. We collectively, among the Nashville Predators um, base here, we know we have seen it. While I wasn't 100% sure that Nashville was going to be able to win against the Canucks in Vancouver because Vancouver was going to want to close it out there, I did feel pretty strongly that Nashville was going to be able to put up a really strong game, even after that game four loss. So in case you missed the game by going to bed at any reasonable hour, or if Bally's, you know, kind of shut you off and you said, that's it, the Predators are going to lose one, nothing series is over. Let me tell you what really happened in our 30 second recap. Nashville had a power play chance in the first period, but couldn't convert. We're going to come back to that. The Canucks and Predators each had two power play chances in the second period, but neither team scored on the man advantage. We're going to come back to that. The second period was probably Nashville's best period, I would say, of this entire series against the Canucks, but it was still 0-0 after 40 minutes. Second period ended kind of weird uh, with the puck going into the bench. Vancouver uh, team all went to the locker room. Nashville wanted more time on the clock. They looked at it, put like point. 6.8 seconds back on the clock and Vancouver had to come back out of the locker room. Um, one of their players, and I can't remember who now came out, like didn't have his pads on or anything because they thought the second period was over. Nothing happened in that 0.6 seconds, but I guess we needed to be technical. UC Saros came up with two huge saves early in the third period, but then gave up a goal to Nikita Zadorov as he skated past several Predators players, a la Steve Rogers on your left from Captain America Winter Soldier, and got Vancouver the lead at 3-11 in the third period. Nashville did get a power play chance again as Dakota Joshua was whistled for boarding on Pretty Boy Vincenzo. And I know you're not going to believe me when I say this, but the Predators scored on the power play. Now, it's not going to look like in your mind what you think a power play goal should look like, but the Predators scored and it counted. Alexander Carrier scored from the blue line. His shot went right through net front traffic and past Shilovs to make it a two to one game. Raise your hand if you had Alexander Carrier scoring the game winning goal in this game. Now put your hand down because you are lying if your hand is in the air. The Nashville Predators collective fandom trauma response was triggered as Shelov's left the net with two minutes left and the Canucks went to play six on five, but Nashville did not want to let a repeat happen. They did not want to see this Vancouver team tie the game up and take it into overtime, especially in Vancouver in front of that crowd. This time, Nashville's top players out there hung on to win this game two to one. So what is the biggest takeaway when you look at this game? For me, the biggest takeaway is the impressive comeback for the Predators. And I'm not just talking coming back from being down in the third period, one nothing, and to win this game 2-1. Yes, that was impressive. But I really think we have to take a minute and say, look, this was a huge comeback for Nashville mentally. You know, some of the key phrases that we have heard from Andrew Burnett around game five, there's no wavering. We went through a little bit of a train wreck at the end of game four, but we were able to walk out alive. Philip Forsberg said things like, we've moved on. We played a damn solid hockey game. Roman Yossi, it's a whole new game. All of these things were said ahead of game five, ahead of winning game five. All of those things were said as the Predators were still trying to cleanse the palate from that horrific collapse in game four. And it's really interesting because Nashville has had some very tough losses this season to come back from. And I did just a quick tally in, in my defense. This tally was at like one in the morning. So am I, am I off a game? I don't think so, but we'll see. There were 14 games this regular season where Nashville had, was beaten by three or more goals. In those 14 games, Nashville lost so badly that they were collectively outscored 75 to 23 
in those 14 games. So we are talking about 14 games where the Predators absolutely soundly and thoroughly lost by three or more goals. In their following games, in the 14 games that followed those losses, Nashville has an 8-4-2 and two record. After games where they lost by three or more goals, they earned points in 10 of their 14 games after a big loss. This is a team that has experience with being resilient. You also have to look at that 18 game point streak. I think that that really helped Nashville kind of grow in resiliency and deal with external pressure, high expectations, a lot of eyes on them from outside of the locker room. And so I think between some really big losses in those comeback games, I think with the pressure and the expectation of that 18 game point streak, I think this Predators team is really growing that resiliency gene. And I know that that's sort of Vancouver's word. You know, Nashville's word is relentless. Vancouver's is resiliency. But we're going to use that. All you can do is what you can do. And that is a statement that is as true in life as it is in hockey. All you can do is what you can do. When you are watching the Predators lose the way they did in game four, you have to know that this team and locker room's mentality is all we can do is what we can do. All you can control is what you can control. And I think that Nashville really showed that that's something that they believe. The word belief, believe, you know, was was something said by so many of the players. Um, Andrew Brunette, Uh, We talked to him after the game, after the game five win, just to sort of get his perspective perspective of, you know, what was his overview of how the ebbs and flows of this game were? Because let's be clear, this game five win wasn't necessarily Nashville's prettiest win. It was not an easy win. Of course, it wasn't an easy win. It was in Vancouver. It was a team that wanted to close out the series at home in front of an excited crowd, a very talented Vancouver team. It was not an easy win. So this is how Andrew Burnett kind of summarized what he saw in the ebb and flow of the game last night. You know, I think coming in, I knew Vancouver, they're, they're going to play their best game. Um, and you know, I thought they, they played really well. It was the best I, I think they played besides the third period in, in, in game um, two, where they kind of went wave after wave a little bit, kind of hemmed us in and think we we're particularly sharp. But I think as a group, we we stuck together. Um, we weathered it. And then I thought we got to our game in the second period. Um, and, and that's kind of us in, in a way, a little bit of that relentless on top of you. Um, had the puck a lot, I felt, missed some chances. And then the third period, I thought it, was, it could go either way. Juice made some unbelievable saves, um, and you know we we got a bounce, and that's been kind of the series so far. Coming up, we're going to take a closer look at some of the game five stats that really lay out kind of the ebb and flow of the game that Andrew Burnett talks about. Plus, I know we don't want to, but we got to talk about the power play. We're going to do that in just a minute, but first, want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors passion, drive, and patience. That's the formula for winning championships. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you are into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusion supply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. This episode is also brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Look, if the hockey playoffs have you pulling your hair out, maybe you want a sports palate cleanse. If you are looking to check out some NBA action, 
you need to check out Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. Game Time's all-in pricing shows you the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout, and you can get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. So take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So Nashville Predators earn themselves an opportunity at a game six here at Bridgestone Arena. On tomorrow's show, we are going to talk about what needs to happen with the Predators at home to extend the series to game seven. There's a lot of adjustments that Nashville could make to make this a little bit easier than the game five win. In game five, do you want to talk about a couple of lineup decisions that were made very close to puck drop? Luke Shen was pulled out of warmups, Tyson Berry in the lineup. Now that's something that we have not seen since March 28th was his last game. He played against Arizona, did have a power play point in that game, two shots. I thought Tyson Berry came in and looked really good. I don't feel like there was any rust on his skates. I thought it was a very interesting choice. Of course, Dante Fabro already in the lineup uh, for the blue line because of the injury to Spencer Stasny that I have not forgotten about. Um, but Tyson Berry came in. And again, you we know the story here in Nashville of Tyson Berry. Only played 41 games in the regular season. Was a healthy scratch most of that time that he was off of the ice. It's just been a rough season for Tyson Berry, but one of the things that we have consistently heard from Andrew Brunette and from Barry Trotz was that Tyson Berry was doing everything he needed to do to help this team. He was at all of the practices, practicing 100% in the locker room was still a really positive voice in the locker room. That's something that we've heard a lot about Tyson Berry. Also have heard from Ryan O'Reilly that he is maybe one of the best chirpers in the locker room. So a little interesting Tyson Berry fact. So Tyson Berry in the lineup. And again, a couple of adjustments. He ended up playing with Ryan McDonough, which I think made for a really interesting pairing. I, I kind of liked that. I have really liked McDonough with Yossi through this series, but Yossi and Fabro have played very well together. And again, I thought McDonough with Tyson Berry was a good match as well. And of course, you're going to keep Jeremy Lazon and Alexander Carrier together. I thought Dante Fabro had a really good game. He only played just over 13 minutes. So that was the least of any defensemen. But he skated with Yossi. He had a couple of very big block shots and defensive plays at clutch times. Tyson Berry came in. And I think probably part of the reason why Andrew Burnett was so comfortable bringing Tyson Berry in, even at the last minute, even with the decision made in warmups, is because Tyson Berry, A, has done the work in the practices, but also because, let's face it, Nashville needed a spark on the power play. And that is one of the ace up the sleeves that Tyson Berry has in his game. He is so good at quarterbacking on the power play. And you saw him do that with the top unit. So let's talk about the power play. This has not been a fun topic for any of us this whole season when it comes to Nashville and the power play. Really kind of gained some momentum during that 18 game point streak, but it just has not been consistently solid for the Predators. And here's the thing about Nashville's power play. When it's good, it's very good, but when it's bad, it's naughty. It's terrible. What we saw last night in the first Nashville power play was just hideous. It was just the worst. Nashville could not make zone entries. And even the second power play was was about that bad. Um, they ended up with four uh, power play opportunities, one shot on goal, 
Gus Nyquist hit the post on an early power play chance. Yossi sort of scored a power play goal that tied the game up in the third. And it was a really big goal. And here's what I think is so important to point out about that goal. It's certainly not the finish of the goal because it was a whole thing. But what I do think you have to point out and, and what needs to be a focus for the Predators is Yossi brought the puck into the zone with speed and then went immediately to the net. The reason that Nashville got something to happen on that power play is because they got the puck in down low. And credit to Vancouver, they have been making it very difficult for Nashville to enter the zone on the power play. And if Nashville did get in the zone and get set up through this whole series, really, Vancouver has limited Nashville to perimeter ice space. They have just not let Nashville get set up in front of the net. This power play goal, again, not particularly attractive. Roman Yossi um, made a shot in close to Shilov. Shilov didn't quite corral the puck and it was stuck sitting there. It was an ugly play. Teddy Bluger kind of dove into the goalie crease when he saw the loose puck. Gus Nike was, was coming in to crash the net. He was kind of pushed by Nikita Zadorov, who saw Nike was coming for the loose puck. Zadorov ended up sort of pushing Bluger, who pushed Shilovs past the goal line. So ultimately, it was Roman Yossi's goal, but it, it was kind of a net front scrum that went Nashville's way. You know what? Still counts. Did look like Vancouver took a minute to really look at that goal long and hard to see if there was goaltender interference. There wasn't goaltender interference. And the goal counted tie game in the third period. I don't know that that made anybody in Nashville feel better having a tie game in the third period, but that was a really big power play goal. We did hear from Andrew Brunette, who talked about the penalty kill. The penalty kill for Nashville last night was excellent. And it has to be excellent. Remember, Vancouver is, I believe, 11th in the regular season when it comes to converting on power play goals. They have one of the most stacked top units on the power play. And the penalty kill was able to really limit any sort of key opportunities on the man advantage for Vancouver. So we heard from Brunette on the penalty kill and then also heard from Roman Yossi, and we got Gus Nyquist's perspective on that third period power play goal. This is what they had to say about the special teams last night. Yeah, I think we, there's an emphasis. I think when you, you know, it's like their PK when you're playing them five games in a row, um, you, you make a few adjustments, but I think the players maybe start understanding what you're saying because they see it time after time and again. And the PK was outstanding. It's a great power play over there. I thought we did it. We did a tremendous job at, at big moments, especially killing two kind of in that, about a six-minute span there. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they took a look at it. But, um, yeah, it was a breakout. We, we, I felt like our breakouts weren't great the first, I don't know how many we had, three. Um, and I had a lot of speed, kicked out to Phil. Phil made a great play. He, he got it right back to me, and I felt like I had a little bit of an opening. Uh, I tried to go around the goalie, and it just somehow laid there. And I don't know what happened after, but um, I kind of laid there and, and saw it go in. So uh, that's all that matters. I'm crashing the net as hard as I can. I see, obviously, it's a nice break in play. Yos makes a move. The puck's behind him. I'm just trying to dive in there. So I, I don't know what happened, to be honest with you. I love that. I don't really know what happened, but I saw the goal. You know, I saw the puck go in, friends. Sometimes that is hockey. Special teams really is so important. And if anybody in Nashville wondered about it before, you know, seeing it in a microcosm of this series with Vancouver, you either get or you give momentum when it comes to special teams. All three of Nashville's first power play chances, Nashville gave Vancouver so much momentum because they were so effective at killing off Nashville's opportunity on the man advantage. And it's a real problem. The Predators are two for 20 in this series, two for 20. When you are given 20 power play chances, that's 20 chances to change the outcome of a game, especially in this series where really it's so tight. We're talking one goal games. So it's not going to win you games unless you correct some things on the power play. It's also very difficult to do when you're playing in a compact series and you know you are going to face that same penalty kill again. A couple other stats that tell the story of last night's game. The first period really was Vancouver's period. I had said in my preview that I thought that Nashville needed to come out and play like the first 10 minutes of that first period the way Vancouver did 
in game one of the first period, first period in, in game five, that was all Vancouver. Again, they came out very, very strong. They had seven high danger chances for compared to Nashville's zero. They also had 67% of the puck possession through the first period really thought that Nashville would have needed to get that first period hot, but what they were able to do was withstand it. And sometimes in hockey, as in life, you just have to withstand and not get knocked down. The second period really was Nashville's better period versus Vancouver. Nashville had 78% of the puck possession. It was really the first time that we have sort of seen, if we look at it in just the right light, Nashville getting Vancouver on their heels. Now, did Vancouver look overwhelmed by Nashville? No, but it was the most consistent offensive push after push after push that we have seen from Nashville against Vancouver in this entire series. Nashville also had four to one when it comes to the high danger chances in the second period. This was still, though, a 0-0 game. After two periods, when you look at the third period, what is so interesting in the stats is talking about Corsi four percentage, which again talks about puck possession, literally split right down the middle, 50-50. This was a third period game that could have gone either way. And the goaltenders were really big in this game. UC Soros. Very important in this game. Now, got to admit, did not like the Zadorov goal that he let in. But I do feel like UC Saros did a really good job tracking pucks. One of the things that is most dangerous about Vancouver is how effective they are on backdoor shots and cross-ice passes. They, they create so many quality chances off of just those two things. And, and they have burned Nashville in this series. I think UC Saros did a really good job tracking those last night because, again, Vancouver set up some great chances. Again, faced seven high danger chances in the first, five in the third. There were a couple moments in this game where I was like, oh, UC Saros is going, you're a Slava Skarov on us. And you know that stresses me out, like get in the goal. Don't come out, get in the goal. It's interesting, though, because after that Zadorov goal, there was quite the ruckus among some of the Nashville fan base about UC Saros. This is something we're going to talk about on tomorrow's show, the fan base and UC Saros through this series. Also, do want to give a shout out to Archer Shilovs. And I know most of you are thinking it's because he's a lab fan. Of course, he has a little place in my heart and I want to make him potato pancakes. But really played well. You cannot complain about your goaltender's performance if you're Vancouver. Yes, on that power play goal, you want him to wrap up that puck, but he has done everything you needed him to do in this game. He has made some really quality saves in this game. So it's been an interesting series when you look at goaltenders, and there have been plenty of goaltenders for Vancouver to look at. Coming up, we're going to talk about why I think this series with this particular opponent is going to be very important for the Nashville Predators, regardless of the outcome. I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that in just a minute. First, I want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We got to pause here. We're going to talk a little bit about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. Okay, that's a penalty. You already talked about them. But friends, there is so much good stuff to get to in Monopoly Go. In this game, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you can unlock. And there are so many prizes to get. You can unlock unique stickers to trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes. There are cool new playing pieces to travel the boards with. Hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a robot pachinko machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download it now, free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. 
Coming up on tomorrow's show, we're going to have more playoff hockey to preview, which is something I'm not sure any of us thought we would be talking about after game five. But Nashville came back to win that game in a solid and strong two to one performance. We're going to talk about what are some of the adjustments that Nashville needs to make if they want to continue to extend this. We're also going to take a look around the rest of the Western Conference playoffs tomorrow. So let's just have a very frank conversation in this segment about the Predators big picture in this playoff series. First of all, remember, no one expected Nashville to make the playoffs. They were not predicted to be a playoff team. Very few thought Nashville could be competitive with Vancouver. I think many, many, many people, whether they were Predators fans or pundits or players or teams across the other league, I think very few thought that Nashville would be able to come back from such a horrific game four collapse and win a game five in Vancouver. This has been a really interesting series for a couple of reasons. First of all, the teams that have played the best in the games have not always come away with the win. So if you're looking at statistics, the outcome doesn't always match the statistics. Statistics don't really tell all of the story of what is happening on the ice in the series. I also think that this series needs to have a little notation beside it because this has been a very demanding series. One of the most physical series that we've had in the first round. And you also have to factor in these two teams are running a gauntlet when we're talking about travel. So there's a lot to look at with this series. Here is what I do want to say, wrapping up this episode. I think this series may be the best thing that happens to the Nashville Predators, regardless of the outcome. And there was debate going into the playoffs. Does Nashville want Vancouver? Do they want Dallas? There is a lot about these two teams that are very similar. And I think playing in a playoff style hockey with the stakes in the playoff in the first round against Vancouver has really been a, a fantastic measuring stick for Predators fans, for Barry Trotz, when it comes to where are the Nashville Predators in this retooling? One thing you have to say, and I feel like people forget this because Nashville's in the playoffs, Barry Trotz never, ever put this team together in last offseason and said, here is my playoff winning team. This is my deep cup run team. He knew that there was going to be more that they needed to do. But there are a lot of similarities between these two teams. And let's be honest, Vancouver is a team that could go deep in the playoffs. Look at goaltending. You have very good goaltending on both of these teams. Thatcher Demko just named a Vesna finalist. I know that we haven't seen him in this series, but you also, you know, can't knock to Smith or Shilovs in this series. But if you're looking at regular season goaltending, you have Demko and you have UC Soros. Not Soros' best season statistically, but but this is a goaltender that a lot of other teams, even teams in the playoffs, would have liked to have had on their roster. You also have that standout two-way defenseman. You've got Roman Yossi, you've got Quinn Hughes. Yossi, 23 goals in the regular season, 85 points. Quinn Hughes, 17 goals in the regular season, 92 points. Both of these defensemen should be in the Norris Trophy conversation. I do think that Quinn Hughes is going to win it, but I think both of them need to be a part of the Norris Trophy conversation. Interestingly, both of them have been relatively neutralized in this series. So I think there's something to really dive into after this series and look at. When it comes to having like a top offensive weapon, these two teams this regular season have that. JT Miller, incredible season, 103 points, 37 goals. Philip Forsberg, incredible season, career season, 48 goals. And remember, Philip Forsberg had that first like 10, 12 game stretch where he only had one goal, but generated statistically some outrageously high expected goals. You have some pretty good support offensive weapons. Of course, you've got Brock Besser, Elias Pettersson for Vancouver. I know Pettersson has underperformed down the stretch and in the playoffs for Vancouver, but he's been very good for them for a lot of the regular season. Nashville has Gus Nyquist and they have Ryan O'Reilly, but I think when you look at these teams, Nashville can see pretty clearly what they're going to need to add to be competitive, to make a deep playoff run, and to be a team that could potentially win their division. 
You need another big offensive threat. You know, you have to wonder, can Ryan O'Reilly and Gus Nyquist, can they repeat? Can they take it up a notch? You know, Barry Trotz may need to go out and find somebody who is Philip Forsberg-esque that can finish chances. You know, you also want to look to put together a team that has a better power play. We talked about the fact that Vancouver finished 11th in the regular season when it comes to power play goals. Nashville has to do a better job at that. Nashville has to come up with either a better power play structure or more talent on the power play. And I really think you're looking at structure. So it has to wonder, is Barry Trotz going out and saying, hey, is there somebody I can add to this coaching staff who can take over special teams and take it up to the next level? The other thing I think this series tells you about Nashville is Nashville needs to get deeper down the middle. You need another top center, Ryan O'Reilly type guy to support Nashville. And this is one of those roles that Nashville has tried to fill several times and it just has not panned out. But Vancouver has JT Miller. They have Pedersen. They have Lindholm. They have Bluger. There is not a bad center down that middle for Vancouver. You've got four lines. Nashville needs better when it comes to that kind of depth. Nashville also is going to need better when it comes to game six on Friday in Nashville if they want to extend the series. They live to fight another day. There is still plenty of fight left in this team. We will, of course, be here at Lockdown Predators getting you ready for Friday's Game 6. Again, coming up tomorrow, we're going to talk about goaltending and UC Soros. We're going to talk about what's going on around the Western Conference as well. And we're going to be here the rest of this week to get you ready for Friday's game. That's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you again for making us your first listen of the day. We will be back tomorrow with some more Nashville Predators talk.